All right. So coming up here in just a few minutes, we will have an amazing speaker, Justine Vaz, and she's um, Stone Soup and Biodiversity Conservation in Palang, Malaysia. So I think it's probably pretty early there her time. I haven't looked at my, my world clock. So we're happy to have her joining us well, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, if you're here in the, in the US. So I am gonna go ahead and bring in Justine. Okay. Hi, good morning. Justine. Hi, hi, the rest of the world. Yes, it's actually not bad. It's only 9.30 in KL. I'm um, sorry, I'm in Penang right now. And yes, good morning from Malaysia. <laughs> and it's really a privilege to be with you. Uh, and it's been so exciting to be enjoying all the talks and presentations over the past two days. It's just been tremendous. Um, I think we've been really heartened, I think just by this, the, the range of different countries represented, as well as the, de the demographics, the age groups from the youth to the old timers who, um, sorry, I didn't mean to mean it that way, but the veterans uh, in conservation, uh, you know, who maintain a, a, a heroic amount of optimism despite the challenges of the past few decades. So yeah. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so I'm going to try and get this presentation up and then hopefully everything goes super smooth. Just a minute. Okay, hang on. First thing to do is to share screen thing. Are you near the beach? Are you heading to the beach right after this? We, we're in a situation where we're not allowed to go out. Uh, so, uh, no. Yeah, the, the beach is never far away. Yeah. Um, okay, so are you seeing my... I'm seeing... Mm -hmm. I see and it's probably you think my right. screen. Okay, now I'm yeah. going to run the presentation. Okay, how's it going? Going great. Okay, so okay. I'm gonna get, I'm just gonna jump in and then um jump in and uh, yeah, I hopefully be good with time. Okay, so I've titled this presentation Stone Soup and Biodiversity Conservation in Penang. And in this presentation, we'll be talking about biodiversity. I'm not, I'm not so sure people are wondering why stone soup, Justine. Uh, all will become clear. Uh, but this is a, a great uh, picture of Penang um, prawn noodles, which is a hugely uh, important meal here in Penang. Uh, of course, Penang is also known as one of the world's great culinary capitals of the world. Uh, it's a melting pot, literally, of people, cultures, and traditions. But we're here today because we're celebrating biodiversity and that's one of the major things about Malaysia. We are one of the world's 17 mega diversity countries. What does that actually mean in real terms? It, it means that, you know, as a rainforest nation, we, together with other many other countries living in the equatorial belt, are responsible for a larger share of protecting the world's uh, biodiversity. Uh, this is just a small snapshot of the kind of species richness found in the natural ecosystems in Malaysia. Uh, I love how they start making an effort of counting 361 mammals, 150 frogs, and then when they get to invertebrates, they just say, well, a lot. Uh, and then that's really true because we have so many species that have not yet been discovered by science, but they are part of what Malaysia means. I think this morning, I think I wanted to start about talking about negative, what it means to be a, a biodiversity country. Um, it's not about the numbers. And I think that one thing that we've tried to drive home at the habitat, it's really about that connection with nature. And I think Malaysians, we've just been waking up this morning. If you opened your windows, in, even if you live in urban areas, you would have heard the melodious call of the magpie robin, right? That's a familiar friend in the morning. And if you were unfortunate, you would have heard the loud, not so melodious call of the call in the morning, always too early, always too loud. If it rains, and there's 50% chance of that, there will be frogs. We have 150 species of frogs. And so the loud singing of frogs, if you happen to have a healthy environment nearby, is part of Malaysia. If you are living near a forest verge, right, the sounds that you will hear will be the woodpeckers, the drumming in the trees as they go about their business. 
And if you're really lucky, you might hear the chuckle of a forest gecko. And as the day fades, if you live near a forest, you will hear the deafening cry of cicadas as the evening shift, like clockwork, takes over from the morning shift as they op occupy different niches. So moving further away, deeper into the interior of the forest, this is Tamanagara National Park, you will have the opportunity to see some of this truly timeless species. Uh, the rhinoceros hornbill, right? You will know what it means to hear the heavy helicopter wing beats of a flock of hornbills. Or most exceptional of all the forest sounds of the deep forest, uh, the captivating duets of our singing apes, the siamang and the agile gibbon shown here, uh, both pictures by Peter Ong. Um, so this is what it means to be Malaysian. And in addition to that, there's, there's the colors that, that all of these species are part of the fabric of life here. And without them, our world would be very dull indeed. So, okay, so now I'm going to take you back to Penang, which is an island uh, on the Western coast of the peninsula. And here's a nice cool map from the colonial period. It was an interesting place. I mean, early part of colonial restoration uh, exploration did take place here. Uh, so Penang, of course, is known for its beaches, but I'm going to take you to the hills. Uh, we are the Habitat Foundation is linked to an organization that uh, is linked to the Habitat Penang Hill, which is on the, the highest uh, one of the hills in the thing. So in order to get there in the past, you would take a sedan chair. Uh, fortunately, as the times changed, there were other modes of transport. And currently, you can get from Georgetown right up to Penang Hill in about 20 minutes on the funicular. And so we come to the habitat. So the habitat is a rainforest discovery park, which is overlooking the pristine and timeless forest, uh, which is actually found in the northwestern point of the island. And this is in, in pretty much its original state uh, for millennia, um, rainforests evolving and changing and doing their thing without any disturbance. And um, so this gives me an opportunity to explain how it works. The Habitat Penang Hill and the Habitat Foundation are actually two different organizations. So the Habitat Foundation actually is linked uh, to the programmatic work, uh, whilst the park is um, showcasing the best of biodiversity and nature and rainforest uh, in an accessible, safe way. The foundation uh, then provides uh, support and grants and projects uh, for biodiversity conservation in Penang, Malaysia, and Southeast Asia. All right, so our jointly, our mission is to conserve, educate, and inspire. So that's what we consider to be our role. Uh, this is a nice way to introduce to you the ways that we introduce infrastructure that allows people to connect and get into the forest and really feel what it's like. Uh, this is our stressed ribbon canopy walk, right, which is over 100 meters above the ground. Um, and we also have charismatic wildlife. This is the adorable dusky leaf monkey um, and uh, a feature of the park. The spe subspecies dusky langur uh, found in Penang Hill are uh, actually only found in Penang Island. And so they're very, very special. Always golden when born. Uh, they change color, uh, as you can see on the right, but they are still remain precocious and cheeky. There are species that are all interlinked with one another. The racket tail drongo follows the dusky langurs uh, because it provides warnings to them and it eats the fruits that the monkeys have shaken down. There are unique and unusual species that uh, captivate people. This is a kaluko, which is a, such an unusual creature, sometimes called a flying lemur, but not doesn't really fly and it's not a lemur. It glides and it exists on its own branch, uh, but closely um, related to primates. Um, there are species that are only found in Penang, and these are uh, lots of endemics are uh, found in this forest here. But I, I think one of the things that's been really eye-opening to me is that best illustrates how important biodiversity is, is the invertebrate world. Um, each is perfect, built for purpose, 
and complex webs of life. Either you're a predator or prey, right? The ways in which creatures have mastered camouflage, like this shy, broad-headed bark spider trying not to be noticed. Or this leaf insect, which just does what it needs to do so tremendously well, just blend in. Or this dead leaf mantis. These are all the 150,000 vertebrates that live in Malaysia. Um, some spiders are just fabulous on their own. This is a heteropoda David Bowie, the David Bowie Huntsman, uh, also found in Penang. And some are just adorable, like this jumping spider, and intelligent. Uh, we, the, we use our park to help people to understand ecosystem services and how important uh, it is to retain biodiversity, not just in big forest uh, refuges, but inside our open areas as well. So what does this have to do with soup? I'm coming to this point. And so we want to just highlight something special that happened at our park, even though we started relatively recently in 2017. Um, this is uh, Dr. Meg Lohman, uh, also known as Canopy Meg. And she had said that there's much more that we should be doing with this park. Uh, it, had, it has the opportunity to trigger something more. And so began an effort to potentially put in a nomination for a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And so this, we, uh, by supporting this, we pulled in scientists, 117 uh, scientists and researchers from Malaysia and other countries, uh, especially big roles to play by California Academy of Sciences. Uh, Jason Learning was there. We had support from WF Hong Kong and everybody in subject specialists fanned into the forest over uh, 10 to 14 days. Uh, I mean, we've been doing massive bio blitz to count the diversity of this forest. Uh, and then we put together documentation that would eventually lead to uh, a compilation that went into the proposal to nominate uh, the Biosphere Reserve, highlighted in the, the purple boundaries. And what was unique and special about it is while we were largely focused on the area which is highlighted in yellow uh, as a biosphere reserve. What happened when we were working with all the government agencies was that everybody started to capture, have a sense of this bigger vision. And so the orange area, the botanical gardens was entered in and additional forest reserves uh, that were, and catchment protection areas were included. And then they were extended to include uh, Penang National Park uh, down by the coast and it extended even further to include the marine conservation area, which is 1.5 nautical miles into the sea. So when all is said and done, what started out as a modest attempt to conserve some of the heritage of the hill became a huge area of 12,000, almost 12,500 hectares, including all of the government agencies and uh, protected area managers overseeing these sites. So when all is said and done, we will have protected uh, a nice continuum of hill forest all the way down to coastal and mangrove forest with the opportunity to conserve habitats for wildlife, for posterity and a core zone, but creating an interactive place for sustainability and human uh, learning. Uh, and as a, one of the world's 700 UNESCO Biosphere Reserves, a part of a network of people seeking balance, living sustainably in, with nature. And so here then is the stone soup. Um, okay, so I think you can put me back on because this is kind of like a discussion. Um, so the stone soup uh, is actually a fable. I think it exists some in some European countries and also Chinese uh, uh, st stories of it. Uh, so it's kind of universal. And the story goes that uh, three travelers, sometimes monks, came into a village, but this was a village that had, had suffered some, um, you know, hardships, right? The people had become closed off. Uh, they had not really seen the, you know, they were not working well together. They saw these strangers as a nuisance and ignored them. So the, the, the monks basically said, okay, let's do something here. So they took out a pot and they started a fire and they put stones inside the pot. And uh, then this started to awaken some curiosity among other people. And they came to say, what are you doing actually? He says, oh, we're making a glorious stone soup. I says, but there's nothing in there. But he says, oh, no, you just wait, just wait. 
and but it would taste a little bit better with some pepper and some salt. And as the story goes, uh, as people started to come in and be curious about it, in came the uh, people coming out from their large, uh, their pantries with pepper and salt and aromatics and potatoes and carrots and other flavoursome things. And before long, they had a magnificent soup and people came anyway. So all this story is sometimes about sharing and selfishness and seeing that you have plenty even in times when you have little, when you are part of a community. But in terms of, I think many of our audience today are conservationists. I tend to use this parable um, as a way to understand what we're talking about uh, with the International Day of Biodiversity. This, so, this thing about we are all part of the solution and there's such a big need for many people to come together to, to find ways to push beyond uh, what we're experiencing now. And, uh, you know, biodiversity is here to tell us that uh, nature is us and what happens to the web of life happens to us. And it is really an urgent time and we have to bring people into the picture. And so it's in a way, the stone soup is an encouragement, I think, uh, for everybody who has, I think among, there is no conservation project or initiative here, which is not difficult. Uh, and it often, if you have doubts about whether you are ready or you're prepared or everything that has been tried has been tried and failed, uh, then this is a parable for you. Oftentimes it's about just putting the first stone in and then letting, uh, others come and be curious because it takes the first step and if you never make the first step you will never get there's a hundred percent chance that you won't succeed because you didn't try and um so in the case of penang right this audacious construction uh and uh in the forest and a plan to do something uh you know most people would be looking on and saying what craziness um to build these canopy walks uh, you, you know, it's, it, it is a crazy thing. And yet, if you hadn't built them, you would never see this view. And so, I mean, this is a kind of a shout out, of course, to the owners of the habitat, because they saw this vision and we are continuing to see the results of it. Um, and it's really this business of the fact that we are at the Anthropocene Malaysia you has a lot has a lot of a big role to play both as a rainforest nation that has a role to play in nature-based climate solutions but also retaining a precious heritage of biodiversity for the world and so this is the stone soup solution right conservation happens at the magical intersection of individuals communities organizations institutions we don't have all the answers but everyone has a role to play in turning the tide and each day is an opportunity to tip the scales in the favor of something better. And so that's us. So we hope that the whole future of Penang is great. This is a view that overlooks Penang as a World Heritage Site uh, on, the, on the town side, but closely linked is this amazing heritage of biodiversity in our backyard. All right, so that's my presentation for you this morning. Thank you, Jesse. That was amazing. I know I'm sure I'm not the only one that um, has not been to Penang, but after seeing that, um, <laughs> it's going to be very, very high on my visitation list to come see. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I can't deny any of it. We are fabulous. This is a great country. We have so much diversity and we love visitors. Um, it's 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 lovely for us to be able to share with the world. Yes. So, mm. some great questions. One of uh, okay. one of the first questions is looking at how you were able to connect the the areas and really expand the protected mm. areas. Is this being replicated elsewhere um, on the island or elsewhere in Malaysia currently? Well, and in truth, I think um, one of the, in actual fact, it was surprisingly quick, right? Um, of course, a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve is not, is, um, 
it's not a it's not a very very strict how shall we say it it's not a very strict designation right but so what was remarkable about that was that all of these areas were under some form of protection already so it was easy for people to say well i have something i can do let me help and put that in and let me help and put that in and why don't we try something bigger and how about we add this and what struck me is that especially if you've been working in conservation for a long time people often there's always the no, right? There's like, oh, can't, haven't tried that, will fail. Uh, oh, there's, it's, it's not been done before. And what struck me about this particular experience was like everybody had got the same idea, like, oh, no, 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 we can add this and we can add that and we can add this. And it was so quick to actually put together all of the parties that who, uh, to be honest, don't traditionally work together. Right. And so um, just it's just somebody from outside saying, oh, how about this? I have a great idea and I think it can be really good for us. Uh, we are hoping, of course, that the Biosphere Reserve triggers a huge opportunity for uh, interaction with the world and each other as we try to troubleshoot this business of sustainability. We need to do so much better. And uh, that, and so that's what's what what that case in Penang is. Of course, the administration of it requires the will and the vision of the state. So that's always going to be something that uh, is going to be important driving forward. But Habitat's always committed to this and uh, we're really looking forward to getting started. Yeah. That's amazing. And I, I think it's really interesting because collaboration mm -hmm. and cooperation is yeah. so important in conservation. Mm -hmm. We don't always see that. Um, you know, yeah. a lot of times we see situations where people are trying to solve things in a silo but it's better you know more minds more groups coming together so it'd be mm -hmm. great if you could um you know elaborate on this collaborative environment yeah. around we are fortunate in penang that we have a uh, it's a university town so we have one of the best universities in penang university science malaysia and so the school of biological science completely got behind this and of course, they have all the subject matter specialists from uh, whether you're studying microbes, <laughs> I mean, everything, fungi, uh, you know, invertebrates and primates, that they're all there to throw in their might and, and uh, ex experience in this process, uh, pulling together the links with other institutions. And yeah, so it was really good. And I, and I think that uh, the message in the stone soup is that everyone offers something different, right? Okay, maybe you're providing the stone or the cauldron, so you've got a big role to play. Those are the leaders and the politicians and the decision makers and the captains of industry. But if you had the pepper and salt, you're equally important, right? Maybe you were providing the potatoes and the carrots and the bay leaves, who cares? But the point is that uh, everyone has something to bring to the picture. And so if you're listening in, if you're a conservation scientist or a biologist, uh, of course you have a role to play in any conservation area. But if you're a parent or a teacher, that role is still huge, right? And creating the sensitivity in what's going to be the next generation of Malaysians. And so everyone has to um, basically be recruited into this push it's not uh, something that can be achieved by just a few people alone or the relevant authorities uh, we are in the fight of our lives we are the last generation that can turn things around uh, that's a heavy heavy thing to swallow um, but i think with enthusiasm and the desire just to try something and be brave and be daring is the message i think that this global biofest is all about yeah absolutely um, and then your your presentation was talking about mm -hmm. just the educational um, component that you guys have, um, which is great because everything starts with education and getting yeah. next generations and you know mm -hmm. current generations really excited about biodiversity and nature. Yeah. So love to hear like what what's really working in the programs that you're doing. Mm. Okay, so here's the thing: we've spent almost okay. Now we're coming into the second year two years under lockdown um, and uh, of course there's nothing beats getting into nature and that was what we was our our staple uh, when we were doing education programs in the school so, but then we have really had to to tap in too hard and realizing everybody now has shifted i mean as in as much as possible has shifted to an online learning mode right and in actual fact we found that there was a dearth of materials 
on biodiversity from Malaysia. So therefore, we had to go out and put the stone in and we created something called the Habitat Academy. So the Habitat Academy is an online module, which is uh, everything you need to know for environmental literacy, focusing uh, on, on examples from Malaysia, right? And even some of our own projects, but definitely our own partners and network and, and friends. So it was a, a really lovely stone soupy kind of situation because I would call a friend uh, in, in KL and say, look, we, we're doing a module on mangroves. Would you please give us some content? Go and record us some content on mangroves. And so it's a, a massive collaboration. And I think it's just brought to life uh, two things, really, how special the ecosystems are and the roles that they're playing, the things that they need to teach us, but also the types of people, the heroes of conservation, youth leaders from every part of Malaysia are now being featured in the modules. And they will be speaking to their counterparts from other parts of Malaysia. And it, of course, it's a very diverse uh, country. You know, there are 60 different ethnic groups, if you're really being true to it. And the fact is we also need to understand everybody lives in a geographically different area. Uh, they all live with, with different relationships to rivers and coasts and mountains and economic activities. Um, and that's just been a really eye-opening and terribly stimulating. It's a lot of work trying to do something in so short a time but we are now able to roll out these modules and uh, really seeing uh, a massive response uh, from Malaysian students really relating to the materials that they've been provided. So yeah, education is huge. We'd love to get back into nature, but there are other ways now if you're creative and uh, tap into that energy among young people to learn. That's amazing. Have you, have you been collaborating with anybody else in, in other countries or other parts of the world? Like to share the type modules that you guys have put together so that maybe there's an opportunity yeah. for application. Well, you know, the Lenovo Edu thing was so interesting because in the some in some ways that's exactly what they've been doing, but on a national, on an international level. Uh, and we've been looking at our own country because you know there's so much that people don't even know about their own country. Yeah. But a huge opportunity to do this on a bigger scale. And end of the day, it's about that human connection um, to nature. To if if we can connect people from across Malaysian Borneo and Peninsula, uh, we can do that with anywhere in the world. We are all in this together, after mm -hmm. all. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. And that is when you when you have the the young school kids out there. Is there a favorite um, insect or animal that they see that they just really? Is there a oh. fan favorite that they really get excited about? You know, if you're a young kid, well, of course everyone loves primates, but mostly they love gross stuff, right? So <laughs> they love gross stuff. If there's gore or carnage or biting mm -hmm. off of the heads, like in that, that fly that you saw, uh, it's excellent. It's great material. Uh, there's, it's full of drama and suspense. There are so many stories to be told. Uh, and um, I don't know, if it's gross stuff, then dude, snakes and lizards and uh, decomposers, if you have to, they're still fascinating and all of them have a role to play. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And, it's my pleasure. And yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, your presentation is fantastic. And I'm sure everybody here um, is now ready to jump on a plane and come visit. I know. We will treat you to some delicious laksa when you get here. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.